Well, let's uh, let's uh, get started. We do have a lot to cover today, and uh, we're very excited to be welcoming you to the Australian Circular Economy Hub's very first online event for 2022. So thank you for joining us. And today we are celebrating the launch of our latest report, Measuring the Circular Economy and Australian Perspective. It's had some really good response so far, and we're really excited to be talking some more about that with you today. But first, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we're all calling in from today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Today, I'm joining from the land of the Yagambeh people, and I invite you to let us know where you're joining from in the chat. So my name is Dr. Nicole Garifano. I'm the head of circular economy development at the ACE Hub. The ACE Hub is funded by the Australian government and our sponsors, Bingo Industries, Keep Cup and Planet Arc Power. And our mission is to facilitate the transition to a circular economy in Australia by providing a knowledge platform for sharing ideas and collaborating. So I want to just uh, reiterate that today's event will be recorded. Uh, so anything you see, you'll be able to catch up on in, in the recording later. Um, it will be available on the website, but we'll also receive a, a follow-up email in the next week or so once we've got that recording ready to go. So today we're excited to speak with the authors of our latest ACE Hub report, developed in collaboration with Edge Environment. And this report is really exciting for us on so many levels, but uh, one level is it's the first publication from the ACE Hub Technical Supporter Program. And it really has been such a wonderful example of collaboration in action. It's been such a joy to work with the team at EDGE on this, on this project. And we're also joined today by an expert contributor to the report from CSIRO and a representative from the Victorian government. And interestingly, Sustainability Victoria is highlighted as a case study in the report, sharing their work on, on developing a draft circular economy measurement framework. And we'll hear some more about that um, a little bit later as well. So together, the idea is that we're going to present and discuss the findings from the research, which really helps to provide, <coughs> excuse me, a baseline of understanding of, of circular economy measurement in Australia. And it really confirms that there is a need for consistent data across all the levels of government and within an agreed framework. So without further ado, we do have quite a bit on today. Uh, I will get straight into introducing our guests for today. And look, no doubt these short introductions are not going to do justice to these wonderful individuals. So please refer back to the bios that appear on the event page uh, just to get more information on our guests. So first off, joining us today is Jess Braun. Jess is the Senior Circular Economy Consultant at Edge Environment. Jess brings extensive experience in circular economy metrics, in strategy, research and implementation. She's currently delivering a material flow analysis to inform the design of a commercial furniture product stewardship scheme and has recently worked on developing the Green Business Council of Australia's circular economy discussion paper and has also contributed to the circular economy roadmap for the Hunter region in New South Wales. So welcome, Jess. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, Dana King is the second uh, representative from, from Edge Environment and the co-author on the report. Dana is the sustainability consultant at Edge Environment, and she has a diverse background in project management, circular economy, environmental risk, property and construction. And she's currently exploring reusable food packaging solutions for Victorian small businesses in preparation for the single use plastic bans to be introduced in that state uh, next year. So again, welcome, Dana. And Dr. Heinz Schandl is the Senior Science Leader at CSIRO. Dr. Schandl has a background in sociology and social and, and, social and economic sciences and investigates the co-evolution of social and eco ecological systems and their transition to sustainability. Heinz is also the chair of the Metrics Working Group and a contributor to this report. And Kate Dundas is the Director of Strategic Foresight and Research at Sustainability Victoria. And Kate is a strategist, designer and tinkerer working in data, futures and the circular economy. She's currently involved in waste data reform, government futures and mapping and measuring the circular economy in Victoria. So a warm welcome to each of you and thank you so much for joining us today and for, for all of your great work in contributing to this, to this report. 
Now, to start proceedings, I have the pleasure of first handing over to Dr. Shandor for to share with us why he sees the measurement of circular economy in Australia as such an important focus. So Heinz, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Nicole, and, and really uh, great to be here. I, I, I didn't have to be asked twice of whether I would like to say a few words uh, at the start of this meeting. Um, some of you may know for the last 20 years, I've been working on the topic of sustainable materials management both with the European Commission, the OECD, and more recently with the United Nations Environment Programme and with the Industry Department and the Environment Department here in Australia. So the, the question I'd like to address over the next three to four minutes is, why should we create metrics for measuring Australia's circular economy? Um, there are many good reasons. Um, when you think globally, we are hitting two boundaries, ever increasing demand of materials and increasing waste and emissions resulting in adverse environmental impacts. And the promise of the circular economy is that it would be a global economic model that helps us to decouple economic growth and human well-being from the consumption of the finite resources and of waste and emissions. And in fact, the science tells us that we have many economically attractive opportunities for circular economy now, and in the long run, um, an economic model based on low carbon development and circular economy uh, promises to be by far the more beneficial economic model in terms of social and environmental outcomes as well. Um, many have heard that the commonplace in management philosophy that what is measured can be managed, but you could put it the opposite way. If we have little or no information, how will we be able to steer the process uh, of transitioning Australia to a circular economy well? So we need, uh, we need data. We need to know what is the, the magnitude of the opportunity that we have in front of us. Uh, that will enable us to inform the public conversation, which at the moment is often focused on a small set of economic indicators and very specific environmental issues related to specific waste materials. For example, the plastics problem, the plastics waste problem. But once we have data, metrics and indicators, we can graduate to a more informed conversation about materials management across the economy. That would provide us with headline indicators, but also with detailed data sets that help to identify priorities and opportunities and provide information and service to the business community of where to invest, uh, where to put your effort. Once we have metrics uh, for how we manage materials in the Australian society, um, and to identify circular economy opportunities, we can align this scientific information and the statistical data with the policy process. It helps us in problem framing to discuss and identify the relevant social goals we want to pursue in the Australian society. It helps us to develop, it, to develop the guiding policy principles, the policy statements, and we can define measurable goals that then guide both the community and, uh, and the businesses. It helps us in policy implementation when we want to plan and communicate what is it that we want to achieve. And a good example, obviously, is the 80% diversion from landfill goal of the, of the national um, uh, policy. And most importantly, we can then monitor and evaluate of whether we're actually achieving with our policies. So as you can see, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, enthusiastic about metrics in general and metrics for a circular economy um, in particular. And I'm very pleased about this new report, which is going to be presented uh, just now, which I feel is a really important stepping stone for creating Australia's circular economy metrics. So thanks for the opportunity and really glad for all of you to be here and back to Nicole. Thanks so much, Heinz. It's really such a, a great pleasure to have you on, on the call today. And thank you for setting the tone. It's really important that when we have these kinds of conversations that we do understand, you know, that we have an agreed context that we're all working towards. So thank you so much for, for being here and, and giving us your insights in, into the importance of measurement. So with that, I will hand over to Jess and Dana. They're going to be taking us through the key findings of the report. So very exciting. Over to you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Nicole. And welcome everyone to our webinar. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to present our report findings to you all. 
Uh, and it's been, it's definitely been a very rewarding and enlightening experience to develop this report in collaboration with Planet Arts Ace Hub as their technical supporter. And we are really excited to share this as our um, one of our steps of contributing to the knowledge sharing and collaborative nature that is the circular economy space. Before we do go any further, I would like to do an acknowledgement of country. So in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. For Jess, she is currently located on the land of the Gaiamagal, Kamaragal and Borogagal people. And for myself, I'm currently located on the land of the Darawal people today. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. And we extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who may be joining us on the call today. For those of you who may not be familiar with EDGE, we are a sustainability consultancy that really uh, grounds our work in science, strategy and storytelling. We work across multiple facets of sustainability of the sustainability space with a mission to create a world where unsustainable is unthinkable. And we've undertaken this report as our first contribute contribution as a technical supporter and as Nicole said it's the first technical supporter collaboration for Ace Hub as well. And we contributed to this report uh, from the Edge Side of Things. It was my colleague Jess on the call today, a senior circular economy consultant. Jenny, who is our head of circular economy and life cycle thinking, also a massive uh, contribution to this report and its writings. And she has also played a previous role in developing the Ace Hub strategic plan together with Ace Hub. And obviously myself, I'm a sustainability consultant within the circular economy and life cycle thinking team. But of course, this was a product of collaboration and a, a lovely one at that. And we would really like to acknowledge and uh, send a big thank you to everyone who was involved in this report, uh, both contributors and those working behind the scenes with us writing the report and all of its efforts. So I would like to thank Nicole, Sean and Jane from the ACE Hub, the ACE Hub Metrics Working Group members, Planet Arc, our local and our international experts and the government representatives who contributed to our survey as well. So what do we wanna learn in this report? What was our intent? When we initially started these conversations uh, between EDGE and ACE Hub, the initial conversations were stemmed around building a, completing a circularity gap report for Australia. However, it was pretty quickly apparent that Australia wasn't quite at that stage in that while some stuff was happening and there was emerging progress and measurement in Australia, it wasn't really clear what it was and what state we were at. And there was also a bit of uncertainty about what the best framework may be for our setting. It may not be the circular, circularity gap report and there's uh, many other frameworks out there that might be best suited for Australia. So with that in mind, we uh, shifted the focus a little bit to uh, first look at how can we better understand the current uh, state of circular economy measurement in Australia, understand what the potential future could look like for that and, and a flavour of what the elements of a framework for Australia would be and what those indicators might be for Australia and obviously to look into those steps to get us from where Australia is currently at once we understood it and into that future vision step. Our approach to do this was uh, in a somewhat accelerated method uh, using qualitative uh, means. So we interviewed external stakeholders and experts in the space, along with a selection of government stakeholders uh, through our research survey. So we had four local experts uh, contribute as well as five international experts, and they represented both public and private sector had experience in industrial ecology, economics, life cycle and material flow assessments, and many were key contributors to the circular measurement programs internationally, such as with the OECD and also nationally with uh, New South Wales Circular. From the government side of things, we had 23 survey respondents uh, for government representation. They fell across all three levels of government, uh, and we were lucky to have a representation from every state and territory from either the state and or local level. And whilst this was a, we use this qualitative exercise as a first picture, and this is the first step and in the process with the next one being that more comprehensive engagement reviews, analyses and strategy development um, based on the findings of this report. Thank you, Dana. So what did we learn from this research? Uh, there is a clear opportunity to build on emerging but currently disconnected circular economy measurement and data to create what could actually be a world-leading 
national approach that drives efficiency and, and quality measurement in this space. Um, and there are some clear next steps to start this progress, this process, sorry. So on the current state of socioeconomy measurement in Australia, we're seeing still a strong focus on waste management. However, um, we have identified several other data sets which can be integrated to start forming a more holistic picture of socioeconomy performance in Australia. Um, and to make widespread progress is, is a great opportunity for government to lead that national approach. So I'll dive a little bit deeper into each one of these um, sort of key findings. So as I mentioned, um, we found that socioeconomic measurement still largely sits in the waste management narrative. It's still um, mostly seen as a solution for waste management issues. Um, and there's less, there is emerging but less of a focus on the benefits it can bring for, uh, for example, society, environment, and the economic benefits it can bring, which um, are starting to be quantified in, in themselves with a few sort of key national studies in that space. Uh, so we're seeing metrics reported on the waste generation in the waste generation, generation space on intensity, um, absolute generation, landfill diversion, recycling rates, for example, with very little on um, those higher R strategies such as reuse, repair, manufacturing, remanufacturing. And these metrics are being driven by strong reporting requirements that are in place um, at that sort of end of life stage. So for licensed waste management facilities and local government controlled waste streams, for example, um, and the requirements are much more scant or sort of there's voluntary studies um, being put in place for things around reuse and repair where we're seeing sort of some industry bodies start to formulate uh, data here. Um, for example, the charitable recycling uh, recyclers of Australia are starting to measure quite a lot of their material flows. Um, and whilst it is, this is fantastic, it does create sort of a patchwork of insights rather than us seeing a more complete picture. Um, but we are seeing some progress. Um, so for example, at the state, state level of really sort of comprehensive progress, Sustainability Victoria is in the process of drafting a circular economy measurement framework, which is encom encompassing waste and many other measures. Um, productivity of their resources, resource consumption, et cetera, um, which Kate may touch on later in today's session. Um, she's on the call with us today. And at the local level, we're also seeing um, a bit of progress beyond the waste space. Um, that a lot of focus on procurement, um, looking at things like how can we procure more recycled content and, and measure what our current procurement is um, in that space as well it is also another sort of challenge and emerging area um, and evaluating um, the environmental impact of various material use scenarios. So despite this focus on waste management, as I mentioned, there are already existing many other data sets that can be pulled together um, along with waste data to start forming that more complete picture of, of circular economy performance. So for example, this includes data on domestic cultivation of, um, of materials, extraction of materials as well, international trade as well of, of products and materials, both, um, both products formed that are coming into the economy as well as uh, waste going out, although we know that uh, wastes leaving the country are, are going to be less now and into the future, um, environment impacts and, and monetary flows between sectors of our economy. Uh, this data is not completely without its issues, uh, even though it is promising that there are sort of um, various data sets out there. For example, there's a lack of harmonization in the waste data across jurisdictions. Um, there's still gaps across the value chain, particularly around the consumption area of the value chain um, and across scales. So for example, there are instances where data is, is great at the national level, but then when you try and get down to the regional level, it, it's very rocky or even non-existent in some cases. Um, so one example, New South Wales Circular has just, um, just pulled together the Australian Circularity Benchmarks, which is the first example of visualising, pulling together these various data sets, uh, and for example, covering energy use, emissions, waste, and material use, um, and benchmarking these across other nations. So this is an, an awesome um, development, very recent development in this space. And finally, we heard very strongly from our research participants that there's a great opportunity for government leadership here, um, capitalising on emerging interest across government departments, jurisdictions, also highly relevant ex expertise which exists, 
Um, you've just heard from Heinz, he's probably one of the absolute leaders in this space. We're very um, privileged to have him on the call today. Uh, and his expertise, along with those of others, could be directed towards creating a world leading methodology for circular economy measurement. The ACE Hub has identified this opportunity for, for leadership and bringing many together, relevant stakeholders together, uh, also across the private and public sectors to share knowledge and, and collaborate. And it has been a really um, beneficial process so far. They've, they've developed a metrics working group. Heinz is, is the chair of that group. Um, and it's been reportedly great, as I've said, uh, but there's definitely a need to dedicate much more resources than this. This is a voluntary group that um, meets approximately monthly or so uh, and throwing a lot more resources to this collaboration and knowledge sharing would really, really accelerate the process um, and benefit all in the circuit economy measurement space. So then looking at the future, uh, the key visions from our research participants saw that circuit economy measurement in Australia included that national measurement framework to provide harmonized direction, drive efficiency and quality um, in those indicators, as well as they had visions around what some of those, the elements of a measurement framework could include across indicators, data systems, governance mechanisms, for example, that would underpin that data collection and sharing. So let's quickly look at, um, thanks Dana, uh, just briefly before we dive into what those visions were, I just thought we would cover there, there are several elements of a measurement framework. Um, so everybody understands what we're referring to. Um, so from the bottom up, this sort of includes the data capture methods and instruments. There's data sets. So once you've captured the data, pulling it all together, there'll be data sets across many aspects of our economy um, to start visualizing circuit, circuit economy performance. There's data systems that manage and integrate all of these various data sources together. There's uh, analysis techniques that you then perform on the data um, and to calculate the chosen set of indicators that are included in that framework. And of course, governance mechanisms, um, collaboration stakeholders all drive the um, sort of setting the direction and the implementation of, of all of these elements. So then if we look at uh, what were actually the visions for some of these elements from, from our research participants. Uh, so as I mentioned, there was, there was a clear vision for a national approach. One that looks at um, other approaches that have been adopted elsewhere in the world uh, and brings in what seems to be suitable um, to allow for comparison with other nations, but as well as adopting a, a certain level of tailoring to our context. So, just to give an example of that, um, measures related, for example, to coastal ecosystems and um, fisheries production might be more relevant to Australia compared to a landlocked nation. But then things that, um, you know, the much more general indicators like you know, rates of our strategies and cyclical material use rate would definitely be applicable across the board. Uh, so some of the indicators that were in, envisioned um, from, from the participants we interviewed and, and surveyed were the cyclical material use rate. So sounds complex. Um, you might all be familiar with the gap report, the circularity gap report. That's the measure that they use in there. So when you see circularity gap, that's uh, the cyclical material use rate. Then there's also, um, there were also envisioned indicators around socioeconomic and environmental impacts and rates of our strategies and our strategies here is, is all of your reuse, repair, recycling, et cetera. Um, indicators around material reusability. So trying to see um, how reusable is what we're putting in now and, and trying to see in the future that everything we place in the economy has a much higher reusability to drive um, many more uses, life cycles, um, and also seeing the productivity of the material that we, that we use go up over time. Uh, the benefits of a national approach uh, that was suggested here cover things like um, efficiency in measurement, providing a sophistication and insights that surpasses um, what sort of individual governments can achieve um, and providing that sort of harmonized, robust and comparable results um, to drive change across scales. So then if we look at uh, more on the sort of data collection and integration elements of that national framework, um, our participants envisioned a highly sophisticated and interoperable 
system that could integrate the many data sources that would be required to calculate the chosen indicators, observe the data and indicators across multiple scales, so from local all the way up to national, um, be flexible because we know that we don't have all of the data that we need right now to measure everything we want, but we know that new data sources will be coming online um, in the future as more advanced technology and policy drives, drives that new data availability. And then um, finally, the vision uh, was that circular economy measurement would ultimately drive action that benefited all. So it wasn't just going to be measurement that um, was done and then and then sat on a shelf. Uh, it would be used to guide decisions around policy settings, interventions, investment decisions, different grant funding, for example, uh, all to make changes that would help us on our journey to circularity um, and hopefully provide sort of immediate benefits. So there were some visions of you know, if a business reports, if there's higher reporting requirements for businesses and they do have to report into this framework that they would be getting direct value back by um, advisory services on how they could improve in these immediate and short term. Thank you, Dana. Hand back to you. Thanks, Jess. And so once we've established where we currently are and actually have a clear picture of Australia's position on measurement at the moment and what that potential future could look like, we really need to think about what our next steps are for government and, and all stakeholders in the space. And in doing so, we identified three core themes to, uh, to pursue in the future for plan, do and evolve. And these are really born out of that need to establish a circular economy measurement framework in Australia and get started and start measuring as soon as it's feasible. So starting with the plan, a strong message that we had uh, coming through in our research and conversations with uh, multiple experts was the need to just get started and that it was going to be a learning journey. Progress over perfection was uh, the perfect way to describe a lot of the feedback we were getting in that there was a need to just get going and get started. And whilst the, you have a look at other nations, uh, especially in Europe, who are already starting, they're definitely demonstrating that uh, perfection in measurement isn't necessarily there yet, but where there is progress, there is learning and we really need to build on that. So to get started, we need to uh, initially allocate specific resources and funding. And as Jess was going through earlier, there is, a, there is progress in this space, but it's definitely uh, quite significantly complemented by voluntary initiatives, uh, time and effort by people. We're often doing this as a, a, a side activity to their main roles and not getting to dedicate specific resources and funding to do this. And we really need to make that shift and have uh, assignment of funds from the government be able to build this out correctly and start off correctly. Once we have those funds and resources in place, it's important for government to collaborate across all levels and departments uh, and also with business and industry and make sure everyone is working together and establish um, what this measurement framework should look like and how it needs to be measured for Australia, what we need to measure, why we need to measure it, and also select those indicators uh, that were uh, there were some suggested through our experts as Jess was saying before, but we really need to uh, comprehensively decide what those are, and that may be uh, supported by, well, should be supported by comprehensive reviews and feasibility analyses of these indicators. So once we've uh, picked out what those indicators would be that suit Australia, we need to see what's what can be readily measured and what may be something that we measure in the future, and start with that baseline uh, to get moving on our measurement. With all of the framework in place, it all goes back to uh, the roles and that element of the framework and making it clear which stakeholders need to do what, who will be measuring, how will they be measuring, where will it be reported to, in what form, who has that governance of it. So it may take the form of the government bodies having the governance of the data management and analysis. However, the businesses who are the ones uh, dealing directly uh, with all the resources may have that responsibility to capture and report the data. And this um, doing this will help inform the next step for to do. So once we have that measurement framework and it's agreed and stakeholders know their roles, we can get started. And it's really important to just start with what can be readily measured and calculate a baseline, uh, which effectively, effectively forms the first iteration of our measurement. So we can use this um, to get immediate insights into how Australia is currently performing 
and also use it to identify areas for action to progress the circular economy transition in Australia and the measurement in Australia, and potentially uh, also the data collection areas that we may need to focus on. So it, um, those areas that we might want to special focus on may be, uh, for example, directing investment and or policy intervention to specific sectors or parts of the value chain. And the baseline can also inform the prioritization of initiatives and help gain that buy-in from uh, stakeholders for implementing these initiatives. And by that, I mean, it may be uh, uh, calculating payback period data, demonstrated cost positive outcomes, cost benefit analyses, and really helping to demonstrate that impact effort justification for pursuing uh, further measurement and further circular economy activities, which can often be that main driver from government and business sense in how they decide whether they're going to commit to an initiative or not. Lastly, and definitely not the least importantly, is really need to drive the use of these findings to educate stakeholders and society on the circular economy and also where Australia is currently sitting at, the benefits of the circular economy, uh, our potential, and really uh, use it as a way to drive the message for measurement and for circular economy transition across Australia. The third step is to pursue continuous evolution of this framework and its indicators to realise the greater insights to Australia moving forward. So as Australia um, progresses in its circular economy transition and improves its understanding of circular economy, expands what it's actually doing in the space, we have that opportunity to uh, evolve the framework to, to suit it. And that kind of goes back to the progress of a perfection and the need um, a learning journey is we want to have the framework in that space of being able to evolve in this nature so that it is always best fit to the state that Australia is currently at and its ability to, to, measure, um, to measure different things in the future. And this is something that we have seen overseas. We can see in like the Netherlands, their model, they have indicators that are expanded over time. And we really want to mimic that here and expand indicators as the data becomes available. And with that addition of data, we need to preemptively uh, put in place funding and resources to uh, implement improvements in the data capture process, in the infrastructure that is required in how we management, manage it. And that may be in the form of digitization or smart data systems that really make it possible to measure what may not be possible now and also easier to uh, manipulate and review and analyze. Uh, and that's across all scales, not, um, making it easier, let's say in regional areas, it's, uh, they may not have the infrastructure that your metro areas do when we want to, want to pursue a baseline and consistency in that data management. And with this ongoing data and repetition of the measurement framework and uh, assessments of where Australia is at, we can really use that to monitor the progress over time and the growth of the measurement in Australia and um, also the Australia's transition and actually be able to understand the impact of our initiatives and it's really our main driver in doing this measurement is that to see what we're doing and know what its impact is in our progress and maybe it's being finally having a way to understand the impact of a policy or a system change which is something that we're really just um, falling a little short on at the moment and there's always room to know more and be able to see and clarify it uh, further. So what can each of you do now? Um, Really, now's the time to get this message out. We, there's a lot of momentum in this space. You've got Sustainability Victoria and New South Wales Circular uh, as domestic players in the space already starting that push. And we really need to capitalize and keep going and ride this uh, momentum to start the conversation in spaces that it's probably not quite where we would like it at and try and drive the agenda to get this measurement framework process moving and moving uh, faster in Australia. So please share the report, share the um, content, your understanding of the report with anyone you know, anyone that's in the space that you think um, would be interested can and can play a role in it. And we want you to ask yourself, what role do you play? Where do you fit into the system of next steps, planning? Uh, is your, are your business or government side? What is it that you can do, your organisation can do, your contacts and help them get involved and start that conversation? It's it's really about reach at this point and getting that knowledge out there, starting that conversation and making sure all our efforts, this is the first step in collaboration. Let's collaborate on sharing how to get this report out and this information now on our agenda to have a better measurement framework. And we, um, it all starts with you and we hope this is the first step in that process. So thank you very much uh, for letting me, letting Jess and us uh, run you through that presentation. 
uh, I hope that's provided you some insights that help you understand Australia's uh, position in the social economy management journey and also um, clarity on where you can help and where, where it's moving in the future and may affect you. I'll just stop my screen then. I'll throw back to you, Nicole, if that's okay. Thank you, Dana and Jess. That was awesome. So exciting to, to hear the key findings from the report. A, a few things that I was noting down, I mean, obviously I've, I've got a bit more of a, an intimate knowledge of what's in the report than perhaps others on the call. But for me, it was really so important to recognise the where we are now. Um, you know, we do have some great examples that are coming out of Europe and, and some of those are cited in the report. And yeah, they are ahead of us, but, but we have some really great um, you know, data that's being collected. And I think for me, um, you know, it, it's so impressive that that we have, we, we've got a really impressive cohort of people that know what they're doing when it comes to measurement in Australia, in a current uh, folk included. Um, but now it's really about generating that cross-departmental, that, that, that cross-supply chain conversation and collaboration to make sure that, and we're doing that under, you know, a, a, an agreed framework, which is really sort of the key takeaway um, from that, from the report. And I think also progress over perfection, you know, that, that's the, the key takeaway. We, we do need to get started. And as Michael mentioned uh, in the chat, that place-focused indicators are really, you know, something to consider for our unique context here in Australia. We can't just pick up what's going on in Europe and drop it in because we do need to have a, a different perspective. Um, Olivia mentioned that we've got some social indicators which to be included, and that is mentioned, I think, as Liam highlighted in the chat. Um, and Kendall talking about collaboration. And I think there was also a comment on design. Uh, you know, at the ACE Hub, we're so focused on, on trying to push those conversations back up to that design element. Um, but it's really about, uh, you know, identifying what we can start with. And, and I think that's that's what we'll get to now uh, in the discussion. And I think, Heinz, um, you know, talking about the uh, what sorts of indicators we, we need to have really leads into the first question that I have for you. Um, you know, from a national perspective, what, what do you see are these critical areas that we need to be shift, you know, using to, to really help this shift to circular economy in Australia? Yeah, no, thanks, Nicole, and thanks to the presenters. I mean, there would be so many answers. Well, focus on something, right, would be, would be important. Um, so, so definitely uh, not start with waste but uh, focus on the whole supply chain of how we use materials in the economy. And as some have said in the chat, that includes our, our um, global supply chains. Most of the products we use are produced overseas and they all come with a waste, a, a resource, um, a carbon impact. Um, they also often depend on primary materials that initially come from Australia, right? So we, we do need um, a good understanding, I believe, on, on, the, on, the, on the materials uh, that are flowing through the Australian economy. And we need to be able to relate this understanding with the economic accounts, with the system of national accounts, because uh, that then allows us to look at different areas of where we can have an impact. So for example, government procurement or procurement uh, of businesses, a very important space. So the, the metrics need to provide information to procurement officers, to businesses. How can we uh, choose materials? How can we engage in processes? How can we use technologies that actually create both uh, the, the circularity benefit in terms of uh, environmental outcomes, but also uh, the, the additional cost reduction uh, that, that you may actually find uh, when you have um, you know, a, 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 good, a, good a good decision made. Um, we, we can look at what households are doing, obviously, that needs to be a component of that. Um, but the role of infrastructure is so important. So these big uh, infrastructure systems for, for providing housing, mobility, communication, food, energy, water, sanitation, um, they play a massive role. So they need to be included in, in the way how we measure. Mm -hmm. um, we, need to, um, we need to understand not just the volumes, but the quality of the material at every step in the process, uh, we need to assess the economic value. We need to know something about the environmental impact and we want to relate to economic activities and where do things happen, which goes back to the, the place-based approach. So, so a yeah. good regional disaggregation, which all points you to setting up a, a data architecture that actually allows you to intersect 
the economic activities, with the geographical characteristics, um, and with, uh, with all the needs that you have in the transition process, including how much employment are we going to get out of, uh, of these initiatives? Uh, what kind of wage growth are we going to see when people start to engage in those areas? Um, yeah. So it's, um, it's, it's a very big uh, question, but question, I would focus on these uh, things that I, that I put forward initially. Yeah, and and so how how do you see those measures as encouraging the shift to, to a circular economy, Heinz? Are there any ones of those that might be quite pivotal in, in you know encouraging that shift? Do you think? So uh, uh, you you know we, we we never know what happens with information, right? In 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 the first place, but let's just assume. Uh, a business, for example, who has a really good information about what they um, what they spend money on when they when they procure all the inputs that they need for their business, or what do they spend on waste management? If you can align that with the environmental information, so that you can easily see what are the the material requirements, uh, what is the energy use, what are the emission and, and waste flows that are associated to how we um, make purchasing decisions. If, if you had that in the system, that would immediately inform uh, business decisions, I would believe, especially yeah. in such businesses where the, the primary material um, and, and the waste cost is actually significant. And there are many such businesses in the Australian context, as, yeah. as you all well know. Great. Thanks, Heinz. So, so what do you think then? Uh, I know we've got big reports that have identified some of the benefits um, economic benefits, greenhouse gas emissions to Australia, but what do you see will be the, the key benefit for Australia from the transition to a circular economy? Um, yeah, let me mention to Nicole. So, so I, I like to speak about a, a triple dividend. So yeah. we have business opportunities, employment, employment opportunities and environmental and resource conservation. Uh, and 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 looking after the, the, the climate. Uh, these, these come as a package. Yeah. And when you think about the very ambitious target of the National Waste Policy Action Plan, 80% diversion from landfill, that's, that sounds like such a big ambition. But with the circular economy uh, encouraged and in place, we can actually achieve that, I believe. But also yeah. we can start to look at emerging um, priorities. So for example, the whole PV uh, sector, uh, the, the oncoming electric vehicles and the batteries for storage and for electric vehicles. Uh, we need to think ahead, you know, five years, 10 years. What are we going to do with all these precious materials? Mm -hmm. Are we set up? Are we building the industries in the country that can actually deal with these materials? So, um, so the, the benefit is large. Uh, yeah. Some have thought it's, it's in, 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 the, in the billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the measurement would actually also allow us when we start to combine the economic assessment with the materials uh, flow analysis to actually get a better picture of how big could this actually be. Mm. And, and when you look at the, the strategies of the, of the federal government, for example, recycling and clean energy as a priority in the modern manufacturing initiative, then you can already see where this could be heading. So yeah, yeah very, very promising Excellent. overall. Thanks, Heinz. Um, we might actually drop over to, to Kate and, and uh, have a bit of a chat about the work that's happening uh, with Sustainability Victoria. What, what are we, what is, what's SV doing in the circular economy space, Kate? Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me today. And I'm joining you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people here in Melbourne. Um, so what's SV doing in the circular economy? Well, at the moment, there's a whole suite of reforms happening across the whole Victorian government. So not just SV, SV is a part of those reforms. And key to that is Recycling Victoria, which is a 10 year and about $500 million action plan to transform our recycling sector and reduce waste. And I know the circular economy is about a lot more than waste and recycling, but it is a really significant investment. So um, a couple of the projects that SV are working on. So we are looking at a new waste data system. And I'm not sure if Kate Turner is on the call, but her magnificent team is thinking about how we expand our waste data set, how we collect it, what we collect, when we collect it, how we analyze it. Um, and this will be enabled through a new Circular Economy Act, which has recently been passed, and that will enable greater data collection powers, which is awesome. One of the things that we struggle with at the moment is some gaps in our data, which I'm sure everybody will understand. 
Um, another initiative that SV is looking at is the Circular Economy Business Innovation Centre, which is a virtual centre and the purpose of that is to foster innovation and collaboration across the supply chain. Again, to reduce waste, but also to think about how we can reuse and repair and generate new streams of revenue for business and to encourage investment and leverage Victoria's design specifically and engineering expertise. Now, if there's anybody in the audience that's got an idea for a circular economy business, you can come along and chat to one of the CVIC staff and talk to them about your ideas and any available funding we might have or opportunities for collaboration. And that's cebic.vic.gov.au. <laughs> um, we also provide hundreds of millions of dollars of grants out into industry to research and development, and also to community groups. I've noticed some of the um, commentary in the chat is about leveraging the impact that we can have at that uh, level. Um, and it's for a variety of interventions across all scales, from large scale manufacturing to new material innovations to repair cafes. And I was just reflecting on what Dr. Hines was talking about, but thinking about looking into the future. So we also use horizon scanning and strategic foresight to think about okay, what's going to happen and what do we need to invest in now? Where's the capacity gaps going to be and how do we, um, how do we get people buying recycled content? And relevant to this um, discussion today is measuring Victoria's circularity. Now, that's one of the deliverables of the RV policy, so the Recycling Victoria policy. But it's a great opportunity, this particular project, to untangle the concept of a circular economy from waste and recycling. And while waste and recycling is a very important part, it's only part of a very complex system of which design and people are really at the heart. And transitioning to a circular economy requires a restructuring of the entire economy and not just fixing waste and recycling. Yeah, and I think that's a really important question, a really important comment, Kate, that, um, you know, talking about needing to, to have that broader discussion. So for, for Victoria, why is the why is their, their attention being placed on, on circular economy by the state, do you feel? And particularly on um, measurement with the latest project. Yeah, measurement's one part of a massive suite of reforms that was um, really driven by the recycling crisis. And right. so it's first fixing a problem and then leveraging that problem into an opportunity. Mm. Um, but the opportunity is immense. It's the opportunity to transform our whole economy across all sectors to dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions and energy consumption and, of course, waste. Um, and part of the amazing thing that we're doing is measuring, thinking about how we measure that transition. And I will talk about the framework that we've recently commissioned. Um, and reporting against the recommendations within that report, so thinking about the circular economy indicators, will help Victoria and hopefully Australia on its journey by highlighting the urgency of the change. So we're going to measure our baseline circularity, demonstrating the benefits of the transition and some quite specific things to government. So monitoring the state progress, which will, will allow us to identify areas where we might need to amend policy, or to think about how we run other interventions, including things like our grants. How do we really focus grants on where the opportunity is most needed? Yeah, fantastic. Is there, I mean, I guess the the adoption, this, this report is, is quite critical in providing that baseline, but it seems like there's such a, um, an agreement across the Victorian government, this is such an important, um, space to be considering around measurement and also that there seems to be this cross this cross departmental discussion i wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about about that report uh, around the sort of measurement and how that's unfolding yeah i'll talk um, about the report and give you a summary of what it told us um, and we've certainly worked across government so we've worked with sv sustainability victoria and um, department of environment land water and planning that's delp the EPA, um, who are the regulators in this space, and beyond. And that's the environment portfolio in Victoria here, but this goes beyond environment into, of course, economics, manufacturing, investment. Um, so SV commissioned Raw Tech, and I think I saw Kat Heinrich in the audience. So hello, yeah. Kat. I'm glad you're here. You can answer any tricky questions. Um, and Circle Economy, so they're based in the Netherlands. 
to recommend a framework for measuring Victoria's transition to a circular economy. Um, and I have noticed not a couple of mentions in the chat about drawing on experience from what's going on globally. So I think circle economy, we're really able to do that because you'll be aware of all of the amazing work that they do. So the recommendations emerged from targeted consultation. So we worked across government and we worked with our stakeholders um, out in the regions as well. A strategic metrics review and a feasibility assessment. And I think everybody on the line will be quite um, aware that there's no perfect indicator to measure the journey from linear to circular, but we need a whole suite of measures to guide action. Um, and the report proposed three metric types, headline, transition and impact indicators. So the headline indicators are really those at a glance things that can give you the holistic view of what's going on in Victoria. Things like what share of our resources circular, what share of our economic activity is circular and how circular are our mindsets. Because it's lots of humans making decisions that gets us to you know, where we're at. And then there's the transition indicators. So they're the things that supplement the headline indicators with a larger set of indicators that paint a more complete picture and unveil all those complexities because it's a complex system about, again, more than waste and recycling. Um, so the report recommended three types of transition indicators, inputs and activities. So they are things that stimulate the transition to a circular economy, things like circular economy policy in instruments. So things like the new act, financial investments, educational activities, that type of thing. Then there's the outputs. So that's specific and measurable deliverables resulting from the activities. Things like pilot projects, business models, city plans for circularity, and then the outcomes of those activities is the third set. And they're specific to societal need. So it's really important to you know, think about societal need and how that aligns with circular economy. So things like housing, health, um, transport. Um, and the report recommends using unique metrics for each societal need because it's they're so very different. So also including things like nutrition, etc. And then finally, there's the impact indicators. So there are things like what happens? What do, we, what do we see as a result of all of that? So things like climate change impacts, our GHG emissions going down, biodiversity impacts, what's happening with habitat, employment impacts, what's happening with jobs and what type of jobs are people doing, health impacts and well-being impacts. So that was the recommendations for the report. Um, there's a lot in there, but what we're now doing is working with stakeholders to refine the way that we, to get feedback on those proposed indicators and all of the different data sets. Right. Um, and then the next stage is then to go out and measure Victoria's circularity. So we'll be putting a tender out probably towards the end of the year to say, okay, we're going to measure it like this, measure it, yeah. <laughs> and then we'll get a baseline for Victoria. And no small really, task, Kate. No small task. <laughs> no. And I really liked um, the perfection. Not, don't be perfect. Just get on with it because yes. we could talk about this for years. Yeah. You know, yeah. everyone has yeah. a view. There's millions of different ways you can do it. We don't have all the data. We just got to get on with it. So yeah. some of the things that have been coming up in the engagement around this are things like how often should we measure? How often should we update the metrics? Um, how frequently should we be thinking about headline indicators versus transition versus impact. Mm -hmm. And then something that I think has already come up is the scale. So we've had lots of discussions with people who are interested in measuring circularity at different scales. So we're talking about Victoria, but there's certainly appetite from municipalities, you know, from council level, precinct scale, um, obviously national um, yeah, so Fantastic. we're going to start with Victoria, yeah. but I think there's plenty of scope to also think about if there's a version that you can do at a smaller scale. I think that's fantastic. And I think it really does come back to the question of scales. It does come back to, we, let's get agreed on, let's say a dozen, you had probably a dozen or so in that list that you read out there. But how, how can we get that those dozen at the local level, at the federal level, and at the state level, so that we can draw those data sets up and then even compare to the international discussion that's going on. 
uh, which is really important as well. So we can all obviously have those, those localised elements, which are obviously really important, but, but being able to have a shared agreed um, set of indicators is, is really, yeah, another important factor. Thanks, Kate. That was really, uh, really grateful for sharing the insights into what's happening with, uh, with the Victorian government. Um, Jess and Dana, this report looked into measurement for governments. We, we decided that we would start with governments. But what is the interplay, do you think, between uh, private sector businesses and governments in, in this measurement space? How can the two feed into each other? I'll, I'll give a go at answering this one, Nicole. It's, firstly, it's essential. It, we've obviously uh, guided our report around what the government could be doing in their position but it's, um, this can't be done alone. And we, we talked a lot about data today and it's, we, a lot of that comes from the business side of things. The businesses are the owners of that data. They're, they're down um, in the depths, getting the data and moving through it. And it's, we really need the government and businesses to be working together to make sure that uh, what needs to be captured is being captured by businesses. And then I see uh, that government space is more in how we manage and facilitate data uh, drive consistency at every level in different states, different sectors, um, different material flows, make sure there's consistency in that data capture, give the support that the businesses need there and, uh, and make sure that we're getting the data capture um, through that. And you can see uh, there's potential, and we said it in the report, that potential benefits from that collaboration is phenomenal at the moment. There, there is a lot of stuff happening in the space between uh, like from New South Wales Circular, SV, uh, uh, various universities, IE Lab, that could benefit from integrating those data sets and aligning mm. that collection and management and analysis practices that are all happening in silos and the mm. efficiencies and the holistic, um, greater understanding of the data can just be phenomenal once we're able to connect them together. But it really is, there's specific roles between the government and the businesses and they need to be working together and yeah. um, working on that side of things. Great, thanks, Dana. And I guess too, we also obviously need to recognise that governments, um, you know, can introduce new policies. So, so businesses may be, may be affected or um, could be part of the discussion in introducing new policies, as Kate was talking about, many stakeholders in this discussion. Um, but maybe for Jess, what, what sort of, um, what will businesses need to do, do you think, to adapt to some of these potential new policies as part of this overall circular economy measurement framework? Yeah, I think the very first step is to uh, frame, frame those changes. Uh, it's, about, it's about reframing this as an opportunity, um, both for individuals um, around that sort of growth or value creation opportunity that might come from having greater data, um, but also um, that transparency with peers, um, that sort of aggregated view of at the industry level uh, and comparison to to how similar industries are doing um, elsewhere. Uh, and also driving that sort of collaboration within industries and, and across value chains um, from needing to, to have that sort of greater reporting requirements. Um, mm -hmm. Then I think it's, it's really worth noting that um, in our experience anyway, when we, when we work with industry, there is actually a massive amount of data out there that we're not seeing at the aggregated level, but. Um, just as part of good business practice, there, there is a lot, of, a lot of data capture and it's about working to improve certain um, even habits and, and processes around um, maintaining that data, for example, maybe even um, integrating it more into contracts with suppliers up and down the supply chain to, to get visibility across the supply chains that um, businesses are working with. Um, and then it's also uh, in order to sort of meet these future requirements, but in a way that's not too or tries to minimise the burden on businesses, it would be looking to things like digitisation, like starting to build that in from, from now into the future so that that's kind of ready to go um, and, uh, and building those skills in the team as well. Yeah, that's a really important point. Um, thank you. We, we have reached our 12 o'clock limit. We did have one more question, which we might ask the panel to respond in and provide some, some answers in terms of um, actions for the audience. We, we might include that in the email next week. Uh, but look, thank you so much to Jess and Dana and Jenny and the EDGE team, and also for the report, of course, to Heinz, to Kate for today's 
uh, webinar launch. It's been such a, a wonderful discussion and it's great to, to hear that everyone's on the same page in terms of how we progress. Uh, if you hadn't read the report yet, I think we put a link in the in the chat, but head to the acehub.org.au website and click on, you can either click on the front page or go to the research section of our work and, and the, yeah, so the link's also been added in the chat. And look, feel free to, to subscribe to the Ace Hub if you're not already. Uh, we've got upcoming events and latest news in the circular economy world. Um, you can also join us on our ACE Hub portal. If you want more information on that, you can get in touch with us at the ACE Hub. But the uh, email for that is, uh, sorry, the website is portal.acehub.org.au. Um, this is a, a circular economy space for collaboration, discussion, interaction, uh, and we would love to, to see you there if you're not already joined. Uh, and finally, you will see some questions appear when we end the webinar. We'd really appreciate you helping uh, to, with your responses to those questions. It really helps us guide what we're doing with our next steps at the ACE Hub and what we can offer you in terms of support. Um, I did want to also thanks uh, to Maddie Ross, who's our events coordinator, and to Lucy and Liam on the call on the chat today. Uh, it's a team effort here at the ACE Hub, so thank you for everyone for, for putting in and, and thank you to all of you for joining us. It's been really a great turnout uh, and we wish you all the very best in your journey to continue towards, towards circular economy and, and let us know how we can help. So thank you everyone and have a wonderful rest of the day and a great weekend. Thank you.